Hi, and welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And we're going to get a lot about power and politics today with my guest, uh, Dr. Gordon Hughes, who is a professor of economics at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, Gordon, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. Welcome. It's a pleasure to join you. Now, I warned you, Gordon, that uh, I asked my guests to introduce themselves. So uh, you have a long CV. You've uh, been in, in academic life and doing a lot of things for a long time. Uh, imagine you've just arrived somewhere, don't know one, anyone, you have 45 seconds, go. Uh, I started out life as an academic. Uh, I'm an economist by discipline, but I'm a stat statistician by much of my practice. But after about 20 years as a straightforward academic, I became more interested in the issues of policy and actually doing things in practice. And so I joined the World Bank in Washington, D.C. to act as a policy advisor, which I did for 10 years. And then I did for a further period of time as an outside consultant. And then eventually I finished up as the chairman of a regulator in the United Kingdom. And at the same time, I have become a specialist in wireless internet services since I run a couple of wireless internet service providers. Uh, so I'm. this is important in the context of what we're going to talk about, because by background, I may be an economist. By inclination, I'm as much an engineer as an economist. I'm interested in the nuts and bolts of how things actually work. Um, and that's added to a long range of experience across a range of infrastructure, including electricity, but also water and gas and telecoms and the like. Well, okay, good. You, you covered the waterfront far better than I might have. So that's great. But today we're going to talk about offshore wind. And this has been an area that I know that you've been studying for what more than a decade now. Um, so if you don't mind, what's happening with the wind energy business in Britain today and in the rest of Europe? This has been very much in the headlines around wind droughts and, and so on. But this is where you have focused on the economics of wind. What's going on now? The, the, the UK government and many other governments in Europe have set very ambitious targets for increasing the total amount of wind power, particularly focusing on offshore wind. Um, in the UK, we have about 10 gigawatts of offshore wind at the moment, and the target is to increase that to something like 40 gigawatts over the next 10 years. So it's a very big increase. And similar um, programs are underway in many other parts of Europe. Now, all of this is based on an assumption that the costs of offshore wind are falling very radically because um, up to now, offshore wind has seemed to be rather expensive, um, nearly two or three times the market price of electricity, and therefore it's hard to justify such large spending. So the big question that um, is really at the heart of much of the debate about wind power is whether the costs really are falling in the way that the advocates for wind power um, are arguing. And this and, is and, and, and this is where you concentrated. And, and what's the short answer here? Are the are the costs of wind power falling well, in particular on offshore? The, the, the short answer is that I believe not but many of people believe I'm fundamentally wrong. And I think I need to provide a little bit of background um, sure. to understand that. Um, the first piece of background is that uh, there has been a long history of failures to realize ambitious projects, particularly when they rely on uh, falling costs. And I'd like to give a brief example. In Britain, we have a high-speed railway being built. We were told when it was planned that it would cost about 30 billion pounds to build. Um, the current cost estimates for building it are over 100 billion pounds, and the realized cost is likely to run anything from 25% to 50% more than that. So let me ask that question. Are costs actually falling then when it comes to wind energy in, in, in Britain and the rest of Europe? Uh, I don't believe so, 
Uh, but on the other hand, there are a lot of people who are absolutely firmly convinced that they have fallen and are continuing to fall. And there's two factors that lie behind these kind of expectations. The first is that there is a long history of people being over-optimistic about new technology. And I would like to give the example of a high-speed railway system that's being built in the United Kingdom, where the original costs were said to be around 30 billion pounds. The current costs are of the order of 100 billion pounds, and it's nowhere near complete. So the reality is that the costs are going to be anything from three to five times what was originally um, thought. And that's a phenomenon that's known as optimism bias. In other words, where the proponents of a policy or a project vastly underestimate the costs or overstate the benefits. And the people who believe that costs are falling are clearly potentially victims of that kind of bias. The second element is that the people who believe that costs are falling use a rather artificial measure known as levelized costs. This is a constructed measure of costs which spreads the capital costs over time, but is artificial because it relies on a set of assumptions that are never realized in practice. And people claim that the, op the levelized costs have been falling because two things that lie outside what we think of as costs. Number one, they've been assuming that the life of wind farms will actually get longer. Historically, very few wind farms have operated for more than 20 years. Now they assume that they'll operate for 30 or 35 years. I find that hard to believe, but on the other hand, all of the cost estimates rely on that kind of assumption. The second but, but, element, but, but, if I, but if I can interrupt, because I think you're on something interesting in, in looking at the, some of your reports, you're, you're, what you've said over and over is that the actual lifespan of these wind projects is likely 15 years, maybe no more. Right? That's and correct. For, and, and, and further, one of the things that just to me intuitively seems wrong about this idea of a 35 year lifespan is that you're putting these these massive machines out there in salt water, which is, I mean, <laughs> salt water is just terrible for everything, right? I mean, it just degrades everything. So, so it, it, if I can repeat what you said, you're saying that these cost assumptions are based on unrealistic timelines, and they're based on it further in terms of the longevity of the project and further they're based on this idea that the costs are going to continue because they're going to get better at doing it, right? Somehow that there's going to be a learning yeah. rate that's going to going to apply. Is that a fair summary? Yes, that's a fair summary. And anybody who has any knowledge of the offshore oil and gas industry is likely to be very skeptical about that, because what we have learned is that the marine environment is incredibly high, harsh and lifespans are really very short unless you spend vast amounts of money on um, essentially protecting the equipment concerned. But there's a further element in that story as well, which is over the last 10 years, interest rates, as we all know, have fallen and have stayed low. Um, that affects the cost of capital for new projects, but they're not going to get any lower. They're as low as they are ever going to be. And if they were to rise, the cost of capital for what are very capital intensive forms of generation is going to get higher, not lower. So the kind of factors that may have underpinned a once-off fall are being translated as being reasons why the costs are going to continue to fall in future, whereas you know, neither of those two factors will apply. But if we look at what we, what we actually can see, because the other element of this is well, technology is going to solve all problems. In other mm, words, that right, somehow yeah. there's going to be a technological revolution and the machines are going to get bigger or better or more reliable. The practicality for offshore wind is that over a period of the last 20 years, the capital costs of building um, new wind farms have increased. They've gone up by about double. And that reason for that is that they've moved to deeper offshore sites which are more expensive to develop and more expensive to operate and maintain and it, could that, i interrupt right there for one second because that's one of the things that i wanted to put on my on, well i've written in on my list of questions 
Because here in the U.S., I mean, and we have a very, I mean, the industry has been, you know, trying to get started now for more than a decade, right? 2011, Secretary of Interior uh, Salazar at that point said, by, ten, by 2020, we'll have 10,000 megawatts of installed offshore capacity. Today, we have 30. So there are only 9,970 megawatts short of the goal that was set 11 years ago. But my point, my question here is that, the 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 resistance to offshore wind has largely been from people on the beach you know own home saying we don't want to see these turbines in on the horizon and so the regulators have said well we'll move them further offshore well the is it true then the further you move them offshore is it axiomatic that the costs go up as they the further offshore you go yes it's that that is almost necessarily the case for two reasons one because the sea depths get greater and you can't build fixed um, foundation turbines in more than roughly 50 or 60 meters of water depth, but they get even very much more expensive as you go from 10 meters to 50 meters. And the second thing is the cables that are required to run from the wind farm to the shore become longer. They have to where they have more movement, they have more problems, and they're less reliable. So. Well, and that's, a, and, and, that's a, and that's an issue that's already been discovered in Rhode Island with some of these, the, the transmission cable from the only wind farm we have, the Block Island project. It's only been in operation a couple of years and already the cables have been exposed. They're having to redo the cabling to bring the, you know, to bring that power ashore. I mean, it seems like just that one issue already has been proven to be very problematic. Indeed, it has, and it's consistently around the world, particularly in Britain and Europe, which is that the cables um, for new wind farms are the most important source of unreliability, of outages. We have a number of um, wind farms where um, they have lost months of operation because they were cable failures. Um, and Gradually, it's also being recognized, even if they're not once off cable failures, they move around because they're moved by the tides and by the uh, waves, and they wear against the rocks on the bed of the sea, and the result is that they have to be replaced. Um, and so what were thought of as being you know, once off large investments at the beginning of the life actually turn out to be things that you're having to redo um, after five, eight, ten years in terms of that. Well, it's interesting that you say that because one of the a few years ago, I was in Montauk on Long Island in the U.S. here and, and uh, talking to fishermen. And one of the things that became obvious in just talking with them a little bit was that the ocean floor is actually rather crowded that when it comes to, you know, there's, the, uh, I've called it the open, the, the vacant land myth, right? And this is one of the things about renewable energy in the U.S. So we'll just put it out there, you know, in flyover country. But the same thing seems to apply when it comes to the ocean, that there's this vacant ocean myth and that there's, oh, there's a lot of open vacant ocean. But in showing me some of these maps, these fishermen were saying, well, here's an area where this is unexploded ordnance and here's a shipwreck and here are these other things. And, you know, is that, is that, is that accurate that there's this vacant ocean myth is, is at work here as well? Uh, especially when we're talking about coastal um, regions, because coastal regions are where the accidents occur, where the depths are shallower and therefore there's more junk around. And there's an element of another part of my life, which is in Internet services. Um, there are cables all over the world which support our conversation and all of the Internet services, and those get regularly cut by anchors that drag for boats, for other accidents that happen, they're all the time at risk. And the idea that many, many cables, I mean, there are pipelines where you spend a lot of money to install a gas pipeline, an oil pipeline, but there are not a lot of them. But once you're starting building lots and lots of wind farms, there are going to be hundreds or thousands of these cables running from somewhere in the North Sea to the coast of Britain. And yes, they will run against rocks and uh, wrecks and all kinds of other stuff. So and they will wear for these reasons. Well, it's interesting you mentioned the fiber optic cables because I know Google has been one of the ones very aggressive in building uh, transoceanic uh, uh, fiber optic cables connecting continents all over the world, right? But this is, I didn't think about it in those terms that 
that's really one cable going point to point. But you're saying you, you put an array of wind turbines, they all have to be connected to each other and then to come ashore, which I hadn't really thought about before. But yeah, you've got to have that that connectivity to each platform, then assembling in a larger cable then that comes ashore. So you're saying this has been one of the key issues of failure. I haven't read anything about this in terms of in the in the popular press. Well, cables, transmission cables and other stuff account for about 25% of the cost of building an offshore wind farm. Uh -huh. um, and they are really, really vulnerable. And offshore, I mean, again, we think that long distance transmission of power under the sea, subsea ones, is a problem that's solved. It isn't. Almost all of them are unreliable. There is a classic example of a subsea transmission cable that runs from Australia to Tasmania in, in Australia, but from the, the main continental part. Um, and that particular cable has been a nightmare for the people who own and operate it in terms of its reliability. We've even got a simple one in England, which runs from the coast of Scotland to the coast of Lancashire. It's only about 100 miles, yet is on and off all of the time, um, because essentially the problems that they face in actually making them work reliably. So. Well, and you've had a failure too. It was it a fire in the in the cable connecting Britain to France, right? Just yes, recently. That, that, that that's that, a two that gigawatt be, cable. That, to be fair, was an onshore file fire. <laughs> it was at one of the um, the end stations of it. But I mean, the the point about these is that this is sensitive, complicated, large scale infrastructure, and it isn't easy to either build or make it work. And it's a consistent matter of maintenance, care, caution, and the like. And, and, and the warning about this is essentially that we under, the, the second part of my story is not only is the capital costs been going up, but the maintenance costs for the wind turbines go up both over time and as the wind farms get older. So they become more and more expensive to keep going. And this is where what we were talking about earlier, which is my projection of a 15 year life comes from. Because the point is that after about 15 years, the expected revenue that you're going to get from the wind farm is less than the costs of keeping the wind farm going. So while physically the turbines might last for 30 years, that's not interesting if they cost so much to keep going that the revenue is all used up by the costs of maintaining them, um, maintaining the cables and all of the other parts of the story. And, and this is where the divergence between my version of reality and as it were, the version that is put forward by the advocates of wind power, which is that they kind of believe that everything is going to get better, that the costs of maintenance are going to get lower, the lives are going to get longer, the costs of building them are going to get lower, and so the costs are going to come down in all directions. Whereas the experience up to today has been precisely the reverse. The costs in practically every respect, apart from the cost of capital, in other words, the borrowing and so forth, right. they've all been going up. Well, so let's back up if you don't mind. So you, you trained as an economist, you worked at the World Bank. So what what brought you to the, the your, as far as I know, one of the first, the only economists that I know of, or, real, or anyone, any analyst anywhere who's done a very deep dive, pardon the pun here, on offshore wind. Um, but what attracted you to this? Why did you get work? Why did you get attracted to this particular area? And you've been doing it now for a decade or more, no? Yeah. Um, well, th 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 there are two elements. Um, I, I, when I was at the World Bank, I worked on climate change. Um, I was I, I dealt with essentially the interface between environment and energy. So I dealt with things like climate change. I dealt with renewable energy um, and a number of other things. And at that time, 
I thought of renewable energy as something that was a huge bonus in the developing world, particularly solar panels made it possible to provide electricity in remote locations where the grid didn't reach and where even if it did reach, it was very unreliable. So it made it possible for people to have everything from television to pumps for water and the like. Um, and therefore, in a sense, I was a, an advocate. I was all in favour of at least the more economic forms of um, off-grid power. Then what happened was that as we became more and more committed as countries to renewable energy, I began to wonder whether on-grid renewable energy made sense, really. And I started to look at it from essentially a position that, well, prove it. In other words, let's see whether this is really the case. And let's see whether it's really following the course that people have come to believe, which is that things start out expensive and they get cheaper and cheaper, you know, as time and experience and so forth. And it was essentially with an open mind that I started on the question of whether the economics of renewable energy look good. So, um, so, to, so to clarify, you were a believer, right? You, you thought that yes. in looking at Africa, that off grid, yes. off grid, and of course, I agree. In some cases, it makes a lot of sense. If you're yes. far from town or you have a very remote location, then it, it makes a lot of sense because it's cheaper than stringing a long wire. But so you, you're a convert. Is that <laughs> I'm interrupting here, or, or you learned that for your through your own work that this wasn't true? I mean, if, if I don't mean to, it, well, I will it, ask it that way. It, Are, I mean, what's the bottom line for you now? I mean, I, I, I want to hear your story, but what, what, what? Cut to the chase. I mean, what do you think now? Is this all re, all the spending on renewables? Is it mis mis misspent pol bad oh, policy it, and misspent capital? It, it's completely wasted capital. It, it, it completely, is completely completely wasted capital, both for solar and wind. You're you're convinced it's completely wasted capital. I, I, I'm I'm more open minded about where things might go for solar than I am for for wind. I think solar is open because there may be technological changes that bring down the costs enough to make it worthwhile, and it's also the case that in the right locations, and that means deserts like the Atacama Desert in Chile or um, Northern Mexico or places like that. It can be very, very um, low cost because the solar resource is very favorable. But and, and, and if you ignore slave labor and polysilicon in China yes. or you, the, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, supply sure, chain sure. issues, I'm so sorry, no, no, no. I have to, have to interrupt. But, but though, yeah, but those things apply to mobile phones and, you know, <laughs> I mean, our civilization is decidedly um, ambivalent <laughs> about all of the problems with go with rare earths and the complexity of the silicon technology. But I mean, if we put those aside and we believe that the necessary resources are available, there are places where solar power can make sense. There are also places in which wind power might make sense. And that may include Texas. But on the other hand, I'm far from sure that that includes, I don't think that that includes the North Sea. And the reason is that it's much cheaper to build uh, wind and operate wind farms in windy, um, large land areas like Texas and so forth. Where, where you can drive up there in a pickup truck and you don't need a work boat that's 60 feet yeah. long and ha with a crew of eight or 10 or 12 it's, or that a couple of people can manage the, the maintenance instead of having yeah. a, a boat that costs several million dollars and that needs to be constantly yeah. repaired and maintained. Yes, exactly. And and, and is and, that is and, that the nut of it? I mean, I mean, in, 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 offshore versus onshore. I mean, you've got saltwater. I mean, is that the fundamental issue about the in terms of the O&M, the, the operation and maintenance that you're getting to there? Yes, I mean it's absolutely those those costs. But bear in mind that I said it might make sense because even for onshore wind, the maintenance costs go up over time. They are much lower than for offshore wind, but they are increasing. And I do not see onshore uh, wind farms going for much longer than fifteen or twenty years either because of the increase in maintenance costs. I mean, 
there is an underlying physical problem. Um, wind turbines are highly stressed uh, mechanisms. They essentially wear out. And at a certain age, they wear out to the point where it isn't sensible to carry on repairing them. Now, everybody claims, everybody believes in the industry that we'll get better at doing that. We'll identify where the failures are coming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Maybe. But on the other hand, on onshore wind, they've had 20 years to do that, and they're still not much better now than they were 20 years ago. And underlying all of that is that the costs are increasing as you get bigger and bigger, because the other big trend has been to build bigger turbines, right. to build them higher with larger blade lengths and the likes. The original turbines that were built in the UK, in Denmark, particularly elsewhere, they were very reliable. They were relatively low cost to run. They were relatively low stressed, perhaps over engineered, but they had relatively low maintenance costs. The current monsters and, and, and they and they were totally and, and they were and they were relatively small. No, we're talking yes. half a half a megawatt or so, less than one megawatt. That's is it? Right. Yes. So, so is it true that is it axiomatic? Is okay. So we, so we talked about axiomatic. The further you get offshore, the higher the cost. But then, is it true then the? And I, I think you're making an important important point here. You this idea we're making the turbines bigger, but as you make them bigger, you, they cost more. Right. They may have better capacity factors, but then you have more material inputs. Right. And it's still it's just a bigger machine that's going to require more steel, more concrete, more copper, etc. They not only cost more, but they also are much harder to maintain. Because think of your problem of having a boat that has to go to an offshore turbine. But now, even if you are an onshore turbine, you have to have a huge great crane to be able to get to repair and replace equipment. You have big, big problems with the turbine blades, which are now twice as long as the turbine blades that you would think. And therefore, they have twice the stresses um, on them. They, are, they are, are prone to what is called blade erosion, which is where junk in the atmosphere hits the blades and gradually pits them and erodes them, and they lose their aerodynamic properties as a consequence of that. I mean, there are all of these kind of elements which mean that going bigger isn't necessarily better. And but, that's that the, the, but that is the overall trend, isn't it? I mean, it's toward this gigantism. I, I, I think about it in terms of offshore wind turbines, this idea, oh, well, we're, we're going to build them bigger. Well, the, the higher, the taller they are, the more people will see them and the more people will say, well, we don't really want to see them, right? That there's a that immediate trade-off in terms of the view shed issue, which I know has been an issue in, in Scotland, uh, in, in particular around... Uh, Oh, uh, Loch Ness, right? That that was an issue around Loch Ness that the, they canceled a project there. Or they did. They dis there was no permit issued because of uh, concerns about tourism because of view shed. So the taller they get, not only do you have that view shed issue, but you have the cost and maintenance issue as well. Yes, and and that in um, heavily populated countries is a major constraint on the expansion of um, onshore wind. Right. which is what might be tolerable as relatively small turbines next to you are okay. They have a bit of a problem because they're noisy, but you know if you can sort that out, that's not so bad. But if you put a turbine, which is the height to the tip of a small mountain, um, lots more people get very unhappy and it becomes smaller and smaller, the potential sites that are regarded as being acceptable to locate them. And of course, in a country like the UK, where the wind resources are said to be very good, they're actually quite variable. Um, we have, you know, we have parts of Scotland which are pretty good because they have quite steady and relative moderate to high winds. But we have large areas in England which are not only heavily populated with lots of people who don't like wind turbines, but also which is just not very windy. And they're not very windy even if you go up from 50 metres to 150 metres. Hmm. Um, and so the result that we finish up is that the amount of area which you can really develop onshore in countries like Britain or Denmark or the Netherlands or elsewhere for wind are 
quite limited, which is why everyone wants to go offshore, because they think, ah, oh, well, we've got much more land or sea, and we can have less people protest if they're 50, you know, they're over the horizon, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But then well, we just... Well, you, well, now you touched on an issue that I wanted to ask about, because that that is what it appears to me. And it seems to me that the same dynamic is in, in play here in the United States. You can't build onshore wind turbines in the state of New York, despite the you know their mandates for net zero or you know zero carbon yep. electricity. Same in California, same in Iowa. Big pushback here in Cal in in Texas in West Texas over a project that was proposed by a Chinese businessman. I mean, I see it all over the country and all over the world. And and it, and you're what I'm hear you saying. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is that the backlash against onshore wind was one of the main reasons for the push for offshore wind? Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's what I'm saying. And and it gets even stronger as people, as the developers, want to go for bigger and bigger turbines. Because the bigger the turbines, the more visibility and the more pushback onshore you're going to get. So um, if if the, you know, the typical um, turbine in the US is probably nowadays between three and four megawatts, they really want to build them at six or seven or eight megawatts. But to do that, you're going to see them from miles and miles away. And therefore, the problem is fundamentally going to be that you simply don't have the accept public acceptance of them in that kind of way. And you can, you can, on the other hand, think whether you're sensible to think about it, but you can think about building a 15 megawatt turbine out in the middle of the North Sea. Um, you know, they're a nightmare to maintain, but on the other hand, you will be allowed to build them. <laughs> so, well, let's talk about that because when you mentioned the North Sea there, one of the things that's intriguing to me is this, the, the idea that we'll quit Har harvesting oil and gas and mining for oil and gas in the offshore. And this is a fight now that's underway in the United States with the Biden administration suspending offshore leasing. Um, but the North Sea has been incredibly important to the to the Britain for energy security for its own production. And it, it is that idea, the big idea, oh, we'll quit producing oil and gas in the North Sea and replace it with wind. Is that is that part of this whole the the bigger picture at, at, at play here? Because the North Sea has been, you know, for 30, 40 years has been a key asset for the British British economy. Yes. The thing is that the North Sea was already a declining province in oil uh -huh. and gas terms. I see. Um, there is a considerable amount of oil still left to be developed, but it's in difficult locations. It's particularly far northwest in the around the Shetlands and in the northwest of Scotland. And so it was becoming more expensive and difficult to develop. And the existing oil fields are very much running down. So we, in and a it's sense, also just a very harsh environment, is it not? I mean, I don't know. Yes. I mean, so I mean, the, the weather, I mean, you, you're, you're a Brit, I don't know anything about the North Sea. I've known, I guess I've passed through it maybe a long time ago. But I mean, what is what is typical weather like in terms of tides changes in, in, in storms? What is that oh, like oh, in the offshore? Well, it's really bad. It's different from the Gulf because the Gulf is very prone to hurricanes. Sure. So essentially, you have to build hurricane resistant things. The problem in the North Sea is it's continuous. You're being continuously battered by relatively high waves, relatively high wind speeds, and essentially an environment which has got almost permanently driving spray. So really, really difficult in terms of the, the northern North Sea. It, so driving that's... spray, you, you've got aerosolized Aerosol. salt, salt, salt exactly. water that yeah. then is going to affect everything that's metal. Yeah, and but, it, uh... it, it affects everything, but but it's bad, you know, and the rigs for the oil industry have to be very, very highly protected and the like. And the problem is that a rig might cost a billion pounds. A turbine, um, a single turbine, might only cost 10 million pounds. In other words, you cannot afford the investment in protection that is normal in the oil and gas industry. Also, the margins aren't anything like as large. I mean, if you've got a good, um, a good field um, in the North Sea, you're going to be generating you know, hundreds of millions of pounds of revenue every year. 
you're not going to be getting anything like that out of a single wind turbine. And mm. so you're trying to operate a marine technology that was developed for a very high margin industry in what is a inherently low margin industry, electricity, simply because we can't afford to pay vastly high prices for electricity. Well, it's interesting. It, the other thing that you, you you in talking about offshore wind and the in the the difficulty of the environment, I was looking at the International Energy Agency's report recently on the mineral intensity of various technologies, right? And offshore wind is off the charts in terms of the mineral intensity, particularly for copper. And if memory serves, I think it was zinc or manganese. That is, what are those? The 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 this is part of the. Um, uh, the effort to you know, weatherproof or ocean-proof the the, the 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 structure itself, right? You need a very specialized alloys in, in the metallurgy too. Is that am I correct on that? Oh yes, I mean, and 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 this is this is a sore point in Scotland itself because um, we don't in Scotland have the firms with the skills or the technology to be able to comply reliably with the high, very high specifications that are required, with the result that we have these farms being developed of the coast, which have most of their capital being imported from China or the Middle East or various other places, because essentially the fabricators, the, you know, all of the service industries and so forth, the skills are somewhere else and they have to be imported. And there is so kind of this. So the job creation, yeah, and you've written about this idea of green jobs, so the job creation for offshore wind you're saying has been minimal. It's minimal because, because it's at the low value end of it. It's essentially the maintenance and the, you know, the low value construction, you know, crewing the ships and the like. But, but the very valuable end of it has all gone abroad. And, and the job creation, I mean, yes, this is green jobs has been a story that's been around for a long time and has never been realized anywhere. Um, it, it's been a running sore. And people complain in Scotland all of the time about it, but it's because they've been led to an unrealistic view about what was feasible in terms of that. And it's, if anything, going to get worse over time, because if the costs are really going to fall, if they were to fall in the way people expect, they will, the technology will become more sophisticated. We don't have the manufacturing skills in Britain to do that because we gave it up in order, in effect, to fund renewable energy. I mean, this is the sad side of the story, which is that we put heavy taxes on energy in order to subsidize investment in renewables. But that then drove the industries out of the UK to go somewhere else. And so when we then want to promote yet more of it, we find that we have to import everything. Because and you don't because you jobs. don't have the manufacturing base to support the industry. Indeed. That's right. Exactly. So, so does this figure in? You you started to say it before and I interrupted as I, and I interrupt my guests a lot, so you'll excuse me, but you said about you you were hopeful for solar but can you say that again so what is your attitude toward the capital spending on wind oh i i, I mean the, the 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 capital the, the the capital spending on wind will generate relatively small jobs in in the local economy i mean the numbers but, but, but before right. you said but you before you said it's a complete waste of money is this is i mean or you, you hedged a little bit but tell me how i mean overall if you look at wind energy onshore offshore what's your what's your bottom line here sir well as a as a as a generating technology if we put climate change to one side as a generating technology there is nothing currently that competes with gas combined cycle generation. It is the preferred um, generation technology of choice. And that is not going to change at any time, likely in the next 10 or 20 years. Now, if you then start to worry about climate change in terms of that, the issue is that 
at the most favorable sites if you put a reasonable price, not a very high, but a reasonable price on the carbon emissions, you would finish up having offshore wind, I'm sorry, onshore wind in the most favorable sites being just about competitive with gas and solar in the most favorable locations, again, just about compatible with gas as well. More expensively, you finish up with nuclear. And if you want low tech, the real competition is between offshore wind and nuclear power. And in my view, at the moment, that works out clearly in favor of nuclear power um, as currently. Now, the problem about nuclear power is that we've made a complete hash of it, partly because of the failure industry itself and partly because of the failure to have a consistent regulatory regime. We've had no willingness to have a clear and consistent and long-term regulatory structure for safety and for other things. But the Chinese can build safe nuclear reactors at probably a half of what we spend to build them. And at that price, they can compete with, uh, I mean, they far cheaper than offshore wind um, is now and is likely to be in the next, um, in the next 10 years, at least possibly the next 20 years. So, well, so well, I'll interrupt there because that's one of the things that I find interesting is that today when you, when, and I'm adamantly pro-nuclear, I've, I've been consistent about this. If we're serious about climate change, we're serious about reducing emissions, we have to be serious about nuclear. But I just feel like in the U.S. and the U.K., we're, we're not serious about nuclear. And meanwhile, the Russians and the Chinese are going full speed ahead and and really dominating the global market. Is that how you yeah. see it? A, a, a large part, a large part of this. Let me go back to a little bit of my own history. Sure. Um, um, when I first went to the World Bank, that was in 1990. One of the earliest things I did was to run a study of nuclear power in the former Eastern Bloc countries in Russia and the various countries around that. And the issue for at that time was around safety and whether it was possible or desirable to invest in new safety uh, measures. Now, at that point, um, in where we were choosing between, in effect, the option of gas, of which there's lots, or um, nuclear power, I always consistently felt that um, gas was a much better option for those countries. But on the other hand, um, as the future of gas becomes more clouded because of the concerns over climate change, then the issue of nuclear is one where we need a consistent framework. I mean, the, the problem in the U US and in the UK has been a complete failure to standardize, to standardize the technology, to standardize the regulations, and to learn from experience. The only country which did that properly, they haven't done it recently, but they did it in the past, was France. Sure. where they standardized on a program, they got the costs down, and they learned how to run, build them and how to run them. The problem is that France made a complete mess of jumping the technology to what is now called the EPR. Right. Um, and they the, got it Euro, wrong. The, Euro, the European pressurized reactor, which That's now right. they've, and they've, they've, they've finished one in, in Okaludo in Finland, right? That's yeah, the one in Finland, but it's the same, the one that they're building in the UK and actually has similar problems in China as well as in France. So they've got four really, really troubled projects, which are because of their failure to um, get the technology right and to standardize properly. But on the well, other hand, so you're in Britain, you're talking about size will see. So this this project that's been waiting and or, or, or no is it, am, am well, I got have I got no, it right? No, Hinkley Point. Hinkley Point, forgive it's me. It's the Hink one that's being built at Hinkley Point now. Okay, right. And but has that been green lighted? I thought that that project was still no, it's, still... it's being constructed. It is now. Okay, gotcha. It, it, it's way over. It, it's way over schedule. It probably won't start operating until twenty twenty eight. So it's six or eight years late. But you see, this is part of the problem. You can't make nuclear work if you're going to take 
10, 15 years to build the damn things. Right. You've got right. to, you've got to standardize it. And the people, I mean, there are two people, the Chinese have learned how to do that. Arguably the Koreans have as well, um, in terms of, you know, they're all uh, uh, pressurized reactors, but, you know, but they know what they're doing. And there is hope for the future. I mean, lots of the people who believe in um, SMR, small modular reactors, right. are essentially believing that by making them smaller, by standardizing them, they can bring the cost down by making them, you know, cookie cutter sure. type right. operations. Yeah. Right. But we've yet to learn whether you can do that. What, what, what the really good operators have learned is how to do them um, with the existing technology, not right. the very small ones, but with big ones. And, and in China, for example, I'm completely convinced that their nuclear power program is the real way that they are going to replace coal in the longer term. It's essentially to build nuclear plants. They won't build them, of course, in the west of the country. They build them in the east along the coast where the sites are good and so forth and where the demand is. Right. Um, because that's where, the po that's where the population that's is. That's where the is population concentrated. is. Right. Yeah. And, and, and everyone talks about the big investment in wind and in solar in China. But when you look at the real numbers, um, it's tiny in relation to the size of the Chinese economy. Oh, um, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that comparison between the Chinese investment in nuclear versus the Chinese investment in solar and wind. Because, you know, here in the US, I'm sure you may be in the same in, in Britain is that, oh, well, look at that, you know, the Chinese, oh, they're just stealing a march on us. Look at all their, the green investments, green investments. But of course, they're building coal plants left and right. But uh, do you have any idea of the numbers or the scale on the ut on the nuclear spending versus the uh, versus what they're spending on wind and solar? Or you, have you looked at that? Oh, I, I don't know the exact figures, but my guess is that they're spending much more on nuclear yes, than they're I, spending I, on. Um, I mean, the, the nuclear program that they have underway um, is much bigger in practical terms, because, of course, we have to adjust for the load factors sure, in terms right. of their, their operation. But the other thing is that all of the wind is being developed in the desert of um, Western China. That means 2,000 kilometers of transmission lines right. to get them. Many of the wind plants that have been built in China don't operate because they're constrained off the system because they can't get the power from where it is being generated to where the demand is. Um, well, well, let's talk about that, because that's been the other issue that now looking at it from, you know, I'm in Texas, you're in, in, in Edinburgh and Scotland. But it seems to me that that issue of high voltage transmission has been the other big issue for development of onshore. We talked about the problem of offshore wind and cables and bringing that, that power ashore and the cables and the fragility of it. But I've also noticed these the backlash against the, the the building of high voltage transmission projects. You call them pylons over there. I guess we call them the the, the transmission towers. But it seems to me to be exact same issue around land use conflicts and people saying we don't want that in our neighborhoods. We don't want this here. And is, am I reading that right in the politics of, of the development of renewables there? Oh, oh. Oh, oh, absolutely. You don't see it quite as visibly because the jurisdictions over the permissions for developing pylons versus those for developing wind farms are a bit different. And so they get away with it a bit more easily in the UK. But in Germany, for example, they have a huge problem of bringing the power from the coastal areas of northern Germany down to the main demand centers, which are in the middle and the south of the country. Right. And, and, and you know, if you think about it, you, pylons are never popular um, and nobody likes to be under a, a very large transmission tower. But if you've got a very high voltage one and you're willing to spend the money, you can put them underground. And they're pretty they're pretty reliable when they're put underground in the right kind of conditions. But the, you but can the, do but the that cost, from a, but, the, but the cost is three or four times the overhead correct. cost, correct? They, they cost a lot more. But if you build a single transmission line in that way from a nuclear power plant to the main grid, 
then that's a cost that you incur once. But if you've got wind farms all over the place, you've got to build the pylons and you've got to build the wires and everything like that in lots and lots of different places. So the problem is that in order to, you know, the underlying problem is land is scarce. Land is scarce not only for actually generation, but for all of the associated infrastructure. Right. And in heavily developed areas of the country, people don't want the land to be used for infrastructure. They don't want roads either, and right. you know, lots of other things. So essentially, you have to ask the question, what makes best use of the land? And that, you know, nuclear power is much better, so is gas is much better because gas you know the thing you do with gas is you put pipelines underground um and you can plants you know gas fired plants they're not noisy they're not obtrusive they're easy and you right. can build them practically anywhere you like whereas wind turbines and solar farms even are just simply unpleasant neighbors and undesirable as forms of land use well, you make a key point, and it's one, I mean, you're singing from my hymnal here, sir. So I've been writing about this now for 10 years, but we've in the U.S. over 300 rejections or restrictions since 2015 from Maine to Hawaii. Uh, but the same happening with uh, with solar. I mean, this summer we saw big solar projects in Nevada, Montana, Pennsylvania, all rejected by local authorities saying we don't want these projects here. And the same with the high voltage transmission. I mean, we have entire states, including Iowa, Arkansas, who've rejected that have rejected high voltage uh, transmission projects. Um, so I, I completely agree with you and the, the land use being the binding constraint. But let me turn to I was looking at your the, the, the paper that you wrote for the Renewable Energy Foundation last year. And by the way, my guest is Gordon Hughes. He's a professor of economics at the University of Edinburgh. You can find more about him at ref.org.uk. A lot of his work is available there. But in your paper last year, you wrote for uh, that the uh, that in I'll read it. You said in 2020, the regulator Ofgem published as part of a public consultation a document prepared by the National Grid Electric System Operator NGESO on the levelized cost of electricity, but redacted almost every single substantive number. So <laughs> that caught my eye because you're doing the work kind of a, of a journalist. You're doing the work of an economist, of an investigator, of an analyst. And what you are implying here is that the government's hiding the ball in terms of what's really happening. Am I reading you right here? Yes, that was a particularly controversial project. It's a project that is being developed in Shetland. Um, Shetland is a group of islands um, considerably to the north of Scotland. Um, and they Fam are famous for famous for their terrible weather, I understand. Uh, yes, and, and really... Uh, closer to Norway um, mm. than to uh, the main parts of Scotland and historically part of Norway um, for a long time you know, because they were settled by the Vikings. Um, and so essentially um, the proposal for the project was going to be a very big wind farm in a particular area of Shetland, which people were unhappy about. But then in order to make sense, they have to export the power. So they then had to build a um, transmission line from Shetland to the shoulder of Scotland, um, near to relatively near to Aberdeen, a distance of a I don't remember the exact number, about 350 miles. Uh -huh. um, and, that and this, was, and this was an offshore project or onshore, just to be clear? Well, it's technically onshore. Okay. But it it looks like an offshore project because essentially it's purely being exported to okay. the mainland of Scotland. Right. So the short the through, turbines were the turbines were being put on 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 the island, but they were going yeah. to export the power through an, a subsea That's subsea correct. cable. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and and so essentially the issue was: would this make sense if you? looked at the costs of not only developing the wind farm, but building the transmission cable. Right. Because in Britain, we require that offshore um, uh, plants, they pay the cost of transmission from the offshore wind farm to the mainland. And they link, be linked to a substation and the costs up to that substation are borne by the wind farm. So I was basically saying, look, if you looked at this logically, you'd do the same for Shetland. Mm 
you'd essentially require that the costs of the transmission line from Shetland to the mainland would be borne by the developer of this project called Viking Project. Right. But of course, they're not going to develop pay that. Uh, who are people who are going to pay are electricity customers in London, and. So from the point of view of the So this is time honored tradition, right? Socialize the cost and privatize exactly. the profits, and right? That's this exactly is exactly <laughs> what's going on. And so and and they did not want to be challenged over this kind of process of socialization, which is why they redacted all of the numbers, because they look so bad. And, and you know, some of the numbers have crept out subsequently, but they look terrible. In terms so, so what are we talking a couple hundred dollars per megawatt hour a couple hundred pounds oh yes you're talking in excess of a couple of hundred uh pounds per megawatt hour because if in, you, in, in one of your other documents you, you were talking about the beatrice project in the in the moray firth and northeast scotland will have a contract for different strike price of 162 pounds per megawatt hour now i haven't done my brits my, my british pounds to dollars comparison lately but over three hundred dollars where we no it's not quite as high as that three, um, that's um that's somewhere of the order of um 220 230 dollars oh, okay right. megawatt hours, but it's pretty high but still let I me mean, you know last year i'm in texas which is an anomalous in the u.s but still our average wholesale price in texas last year was 22 dollars if memory serves i mean you know this is partly yes. due to the effect of wind and so on but these are inc incredibly high prices. Oh, yes, I are. guess my observation here is that when it, all of the offshore projects that I've seen, all of them, they have contract prices that are far, far above what is the common wholesale price but, in but, the markets but, in which they're but, serving. But this, but this is where the people claim that it's all going to change in future. It's all miraculously going to get better because <laughs> they say, oh, well, a miracle will happen and save our bacon in the future. Exactly. And, and, and the cost, they say that the costs are going to come down to around 40 pounds per megawatt hour, mm. which is more or less equal to where the market price was um, a couple of years ago. I mean, bear in mind, the last year in, in Europe has gone mad because of um, the gas prices and sure. electricity prices have gone through the roof. But but you know the long run prices are around forty pounds a megawatt hour, and so they're claiming that offshore wind is going to get down to that level. And what makes it even more complicated is that people are also claiming that they are bidding for these contracts for differences, in other words, to supply at £40 a megawatt hour. The problem is whether you really believe that they are going to supply at that kind of level, because the contracts are very complex. The contracts are um, subject to being abrogated, in other words, broken um, by the suppliers. And I very strongly believe that either the people who have promised that they're going to deliver at that kind of price are essentially going to lose their shirts or alternatively that they're expecting something to change in future and they're going to abrogate the contract and get much higher prices because and, and, and socialize the cost and socialize the cost so so essentially they're hoping to be bailed out by some big change in future and that and i mean my in a sense, my challenge to the people who say that the costs are so low is I will write a five page contract with no get outs, with an absolutely firm commitment to deliver. And you sign up for that for the next 30 years. And if you're willing to do that, I'll buy the story. But until <laughs> you are willing to do that, um, th then in effect, this is a game in which we are only seeing a half of what is going on. And the rest of what is going on is essentially a whole series of either implicit subsidies or expectations that things are going to change in future and the like. In terms so of they're, that. The, that they're going to do some kind of government engineering to make it work somehow. Yes, of course. The, 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 because and is that the, is the, that the right word? I've, I haven't heard that term before. It just kind of popped I mean, in my head, but that you're going to yes, somehow because, get the government to pick it up. 
Yes, of course. Be well, it is, won't be the government. It will be you and I. Oh, I mean, okay. Not you, but I. Yes. Uh, and my, you know, and my um, the people who live in the United Kingdom, because essentially, at some point or other, either these projects go bankrupt, and they have to be bailed out, or alternatively. Um, they are going to be indirectly bailed out by being offered much higher prices than apparently they were being promised in terms of that. And the so, they, so they either they either go bankrupt or they make the consumers pay for their costs. Yes, that's right. And the big danger built in this is that we're all being urged to invest in green investments. So all of the governments around Europe are telling their pension funds that people's savings should be invested in this kind of thing, whether it be solar or whether it be wind farms or whatever. And this, they claim, is going to be a good investment. Well, what happens when 20 years down the line, a whole bunch of these go bankrupt and people's pensions get badly hit? You know, there is all kinds of ways in which the outcome of this could be very messy and very unpleasant and very painful for the people who have bought into the story that these costs really are going down very greatly. Well, you, it's interesting that you bring that up because it reminds me of the knock-on effects of the shortages of gas now in Britain and the shutdown of your fertilizer plants. Right? Your fertilizer plants are being shut down because gas price, nat gas prices are so high. And then if what happens in year one, year two, year three, where you don't have enough fertilizer for your farms, your food production goes down, your food prices go. I mean, the knock on effects of, of all of this craze is what I would call it seem to be completely underappreciated. But but what's at root here? I mean, it seems like the social marketing is part of this, right? That there's just incredibly effective social marketing and the main the big media outlets and all of them are just kind of bought on board. Oh, these offshore winds is going to be so great. So great. So I mean, I see it here in the US as well. Is that what do you attribute this to this kind of mania, the craze around it? Because you've made it very clear you're not a fan of what's going on. What's what's the driver here? I, I, I think there is a, a, a larger social disconnect which underpins all of this. Most of the enthusiasm for these kind of things comes from what we would call liberal, urban, um, often relatively young people. Right. This is notoriously a group with practically no engineering or scientific skills or experience, with very little practical day-to-day -day experience of the nitty gritty of making things work and so forth. And that's why I introduced myself by saying that at heart, I'm as much an engineer as I am an economist in the sense that I was brought up on a farm. I live in um, a rural area of Scotland I run a broadband system which is designed to do very thinly populated areas. Those are things where you have to get things right, where you have to live with the reality of the weather, the land, all of those kind of things. People are divorced from that when they live in London or even in Houston um, or in Austin and the like. And and it's very easy to buy into the story that everything looks like what has happened to smartphones, that everything looks like the Silicon Revolution. And it's very hard to comprehend that that's not the way the world looked when I was much younger than I am. You know, I'm 75 now. So I've seen the way the world has developed since the 1960s onwards. And it's been much more difficult and much more painful, the changes, and in most cases, much slower in terms of the kind of hype about development that is now accepted as normal. And so essentially, you have a combination of journalists, of lobbyists, of uh, many, many other people who simply are divorced from the day-to-day -day reality of the things that they are making these claims about. And because 
they are living in this kind of bubble. I mean, I find it very hard to blame everything on sort of mainstream media and the like, but there's no doubt that there is an urban bubble. And I lived in it when I lived in and worked in Washington. It's just so divorced from the rest of the country. I mean, everybody in Washington is completely, I mean, you referred to flyover country. It's a standard term, but it's a horrible term. It's derogatory about it, it all is, of the people who live in Iowa or Montana or um, all of these other states in terms of that. Well, well, and I think that that, uh, and I, I talk about this a lot, it's the urban-rural divide. And you see yep. it in the voting maps here in the U.S. where the you know overwhelming number of rural counties in America voted for Trump and, 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 and vote Republican, where the cities vote Democratic, right? And, and that that's... But this, I think it, it 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 rhymes with what you know what you're talking about makes sense to me because there is this schism between the 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 people who consume natural resources and the people who produce them, right? And that that's a very big divide. And there yes. the people who consume them who've never worked on a farm, never you know had that experience of working with their hands or you know driving a tractor or producing things or pulling things up, pulling things out of the ground. They have no idea what it entails. And so I think that that. That's that's fundamentally at work here. But is that what drives you? Because I'm, you know, you've been passionate in your discussion here, and you've obviously been working on these. So, what what makes you care about this so much? Well, the the, the bigger story is that I said that I was committed to renewables because of what it offered in developing countries to poor people off the grid. The whole of my life has mostly been focused on developing countries, on alleviating poverty, on all of the things that come with economic progress. And I see this commitment to renewable energy as profoundly um, dangerous from the point of view of economic development in future. Because if we were to push all of the developing countries to rely on wind turbines or even solar panels. We would push them into a world of expensive energy. We would greatly reduce their ability to gain the benefits of economic growth. And so ultimately, my biggest motivation is that do not impose this on Africa. Do not impose this on Brazil or on you know, or India or many of the other places um, that, that, you know, that I have worked over my, simply because this is an obsession of a small part of the world's population adopted without understanding what the effect is going to be on the majority of the rest of the world in terms of that. And you know that that is that is a real concern in terms of the what i saw when i was at the world bank which is european and americans europeans and americans believing that what they thought was normal should be imposed on everybody else even if it was not appropriate to the levels of development the technology the capacity of the countries concerned and so what i see is this commitment to renewable energy as just being forced on countries for whom it will be uh, not to put too mild it disastrous it, it, it's it's I, I really am enjoying hearing what you're saying because it's it, it speaks to your commitment that i mean what i hear you saying is this is your purpose i mean you said you're 75 that this is your purpose in what your life is now that you've seen you've seen you've you've, you've grown on a farm you've been to the you've seen the potential but as you've looked at it you realizing well that we've been sold a bill of goods is that um, am i making am i am i yeah, yes. summarizing the, where you are the, my, both my academic and my practitioner career as a, a as a policy maker and as a practitioner was devoted to developing countries i i only really returned to deal with as it were my own country and um the developed world a decade ago uh, we, at the point, as you say, when I started to look at renewable energy and various other things, simply because I saw what was happening in terms of the developing world 
of being pushed with an agenda which wasn't about them. It wasn't about the interests of people who live in the Congo or in you know, many other parts of Africa. It was about the guilt and concerns of people in rich countries simply not understanding or not willing to think about whether this was suitable. And there was another element to all of that, which is at that time, I also led a very large study that the World Bank carried out on adaptation to climate change. Mm. And I became convinced at that point that we would be better off slowing our attempts to mitigate climate change and do more to adapt to it, particularly in the developing world. And my concerns have been that all of the emphasis on renewables and on slowing climate change have essentially not been in the interests of developing countries because they would have been better off going slower and adapt, spending more money on adapting and living with um, climate change than a relatively vain effort to slow up um, the process via very large expenditures on mitigation. So this is not about saying, you know, you know what we talked about earlier. You know, this is not in any way about challenging whether climate change is occurring. It's about how we should, should respond to right. that. Well, and what you're, and what I hear you saying is very similar to what Bjorn Lomborg has argued. I, I, if I were to, you know, distill down what he's saying is that mitigation is going to be far too costly, and we're better off um, a, 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 a adapting. Is that that's a, he's been on the podcast as well, and that's yeah. I, Bjorn, Bjorn Lomborg and I show almost exactly parallel views, and actually for reasons that go beyond that, because he's done a lot of work on. Um, the uh, health effects of right. climate change and various other things like that. I've never met him. I've never talked with him. But essentially, I believe that he has gone down a route which any intelligent economist, open-minded economist, with a primary concern with developing countries could well have gone down as well. Um, and, and, and that is to say that, you know, Climate, and there's another element. Climate change isn't the most important from the world as a whole, not from the point of view of rich countries, but for the world as a whole, climate change is not the most important environmental problem. We've known that for 30 years. Um, and I wrote the first papers on actually the importance of climate change for the World Bank. So, you know, but the point is that you go to China and you understand why China puts other things first. Because for them, urban air pollution is far more important mm. and they need to do something about that. And then for them, therefore, their primary concern is to deal with their problems rather than with global problems. Sure. And, and, you know, and, and they will do that. And, and that's why mitigation is going to be so difficult, because China knows what it wants to do. And it in the end, isn't going to be pressed to do something different. Right. So my guest again is uh, Gordon Hughes, uh, Dr. Gordon Hughes. He's a professor of economics at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. You can find his work at ref.org.uk. That's the Renewable Energy Foundation. So uh, Gordon, I've taken up more than an hour. We've been, we've been going on and I could probably talk to you all day, but I always ask two questions uh, in summary from, from my, my guests. We've talked about a lot of things. What gives you hope? Um, not much, to be honest. <laughs> I, 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 I fear that the route that we're on in the rich world is a route which is simply going to lead to the passage of economic and um, probably cultural and other power from the old countries of Europe and even probably the United States to Asia over the next 20, 30 years. I think that's almost inevitable on the route that we're set on. And the consequence- well, if, if I could interrupt, because I, I read a piece just in the last few days and in, in the author, it was very clear, it was very clever. It was in Zero Hedge, I recall. I don't recall the author's name, but he called what's going on in the US and the UK uh, unilateral energy disarmament. <laughs> 
Does that, does that yes. ring a bell with your, does that rhyme with what you're thinking? Well, I, I mean, basically what it's doing is deliberately foregoing the kind of economic activities which rely heavily on energy by pushing up the prices of energy so that what is left is essentially marginal and that all of the, the, the real um, value added is going to be, some of it is in intellectual property, but that intellectual property can be stolen and is eroded over time. And so gradually, the things in terms of producing goods, in terms of producing raw materials and so forth, those are going to pass to um, um, Asia, particularly, maybe to Africa, but I think primarily to Asia. And, and essentially, we in the Western countries are deciding that we are in effect rich enough and don't care enough to essentially go almost into the position of China in the 18th century, which is to retreat from the world, and, to and, retreat and, from and, the rest of... And deindustrialize. And deindustrialize, yes. And... So, well... Uh... I've, I've done dozens of interviews on the podcast and asked people what they <laughs> what gives them hope and you're the first to say not not much but that's okay what are you reading what am i reading yes what are you reading what books are on your nightstand or are on your desk or what are, what are the books that you're paying attention to these days oh um uh, the main ones i'm reading at the moment i i mean i for leisure i read historical um history and I've got two books on Chinese history um, in the uh, later part, you know, the, the, the final centuries BC and the first few centuries AD, which is the, the great expansion of Han China um, and then its challenge from other parts of Eurasia. Um, I, I, I mean, you, I you prefer know, you to know, you know the You know the title that from the, the, the book, just any specific titles that you can mention? Oh, uh, I, 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 um, I don't recall, unfortunately, the title, no um, because it's it's a set of histories written by Mark Andrews or something like that. Uh, anyway, but 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 I you know, I have always been fascinated to read the histories of the countries where I have worked, and for a long period of time I have worked on and off in China and I have a very strong interest in not only economics of what is going on in China but also the the history of it as well and that's why I'm reading about the the various periods I mean the particular period is the warring states period um, mm. when because essentially China is an old old civilization even by our standards. Right. Um, I've also read a great deal about um, Japan. And what you see about Japan is the extent to which Japan developed on the basis of what it, it will not admit this, but on the basis of what it got from China. Mm. Um, that, 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 you know, Japan developed the most you know, famous period of Japanese development was in the second half of the first millennium, in other words, from roughly 500 to 1000 um, AD. And that was based on importing a whole series of cultural things from religion, Buddha, Buddhism, and so forth from China. So China is the oldest extant, you know, still present civilization that is just simply fascinating and about which too few people in the West know anything. Well, let's end it there. Uh, that was uh, that was a deeply enjoyable conversation. My guest has been Gordon Hughes. He's a professor of economics at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, you can find out more about him at REF. That's the Renewable Energy Foundation, ref.org.uk. Uh, Gordon, it's been a pleasure. Many thanks for being on the Power Hungry podcast. It's been very interesting. I've enjoyed it. Thanks. And uh, thanks to all of you for tuning in to this uh, edition of this episode of the podcast. Make sure and tune in the next time. And if you have a minute, then uh, give us a, one of those positive ratings on those uh, podcast thingies, which uh, is pretty easy to do, I think. So until then, thanks, y'all.